What do you think, boy? Do you like the bike? Do you like the bike? <laughs> Not yet, dude. A little bit more. You'll get fed soon. It's something you don't want. <laughs> Welcome to another edition of Saturday Sportster. So we're uh, putting a one inch stem front end on this bike and we have a conversion kit uh, that takes neck cups with Timken races for a one inch stem like a big twin Harley stem, uh, Harley front end. And we're going to fit it on our iron head. Luckily I had a uh, set of mock-up cups that I turned down so they fit into the front end, these should actually get pressed in. You see how they kind of just drop in. If your neck cups just drop in like that, that is no bueno and you're gonna have to get a different size cups or do something a little differently. Sometimes stuff can get worn out, but you don't want them to drop in. You're gonna have to actually uh, press them in, which I'll show you to do in a minute. But luckily I have some neck cups for mock-up, which I'm going to use um, for this bottom part of the neck because you can see all the way inserted, there's a little gap in the back over here, uh, which I'm going to have to clearance a little bit because these style neck cups have a more of a 90 degree edge in the corner and the stock ones have a larger radius. So that's why they don't fit. But these are the cups that we want to run. So I'm going to clearance the neck to fit these on our frame. With this neck cup that I use for mock up, I'm going to put this in, uh, in the tube and actually mark how much I'm going to clearance off of the frame. I know it's black on black, but uh, it'll give me a good enough reference point. You also don't want to remove any material from the face of where the neck cup gets pressed. It'll be okay if it's a little low on the outside, but the face of the neck cup that actually sits against the neck tube, you don't want to remove any material off the face of the neck. So I'm actually going to use a marker and just put some black around it so that I can see instantly if I start to hit that surface. And where I have my mark on the outside, I want to bring down into the area, uh, basically just below or to the same plane as this surface. Okay, so like I said before, we're putting a one inch front end on this. It'll, I uh, just wanted to show you basically how these cups are used because there's a lot more one inch for, uh, stem front ends out there than say the 7 stock Sportster front ends. This kit's really great because it 
uh, comes with cups with Timken races already pressed in and two Timken bearings so you can essentially bolt on whatever front end that you want that has a one inch stem. The cups are so large because it moves the, um, the bolting location out so you, where your triple trees clamp to be a stock big twin dimension. So essentially any big twin front end with one inch stem should fit on your bike. Whether or not it's the right length to get you the ride height, you'll have to determine later. Okay, so I'm gonna press these in, and before I set them on the neck, I like to put a little bit of air tool oil on them, or just any kind of thin, uh, just a thin oil, just to help them press in easier. And those should stay, uh, they should stay in the neck. They do have a big countersink on here to kind of help guide it in. But I put a little oil on there. And like I said, just a light, just light oil. Doesn't have to be air tool, but air tool is pretty light. Oh, okay. And to do this, we're gonna be using the Fast Eddy number 11 neck cup and race installer. Uh, it fits all big twin and XL, says right on the part, made in the USA. Just a really nice looking tool. I really like the finish he uses. And also I really like how, how nice these uh, spacers fit into the Timken races to help guide these cups in. Okay, so to fit this together, you're gonna have one of these spacers with the taper on it at the bottom of the tool. And this taper actually sits nice against the Timken race that's on the inside of the cup. And you slip it in through the bottom and you're gonna put the corresponding part on the top inside the cup. It has the other spacer that goes on the top. And then this big nut on the top threads on and it has this nice uh, sleeve that's actually separate so that uh, one part can spin and the other part's locked on for when you actually go to tighten this up. I wonder if I have to move the pin at the bottom. And then when you start this off, you wanna be careful to start to guide this. So it goes in straight. Oh. And when you do that, you just want to make sure that you don't have any gaps anywhere. You're just going to want to snug it up some. Oh, and it looks like we're touching everywhere. And that's it. Oh, man. Wow, that worked really nice. The uh, Jim's ones that I've seen in the past are just a threaded rod with two nuts on either end. So you got to use two uh, wrenches. Really like this handle that he has on here. Man, that thing worked great. Okay, so now uh, since I have the cups pressed in, I'm gonna assemble the front end starting with the trees. And so I, uh, you can see there's a crusty old Timken on there, but we're, we're just gonna use that for mock-up. And the top one I didn't add grease to yet because it's also just for mock-up. This is just gonna have to come apart. So I'm gonna stick that in here, uh, fit that in there. And I got my dust shield that's gonna go on the top and then my top tree, and then, right, I gotta put the nut on with it. Right. Just a 
here. And now we're going to put our tubes and lowers in, but I just noticed that the bore of the bottom tree is pretty filthy. So I'm going to clean that up before I even bother to stick the tube in here just to help me, uh, just for everything to go in smoothly. You can use a little bit of sandpaper if it's really bad. I would use maybe a barrel sander, something not so aggressive. I'm using 220, just sandpaper right now. Cause it's not, it's not really too bad. There we go. That looks a lot better. I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. You also sometimes want to check for burrs where it's split because that could also impede the uh, tube going into the bottom of the tree. And another thing that I see a lot of people do the first time that they do this is they like to twist the tube back and forth. But when you do that, you'll see a bunch of zigzags on the side of the tube when you when after you get it in. Unless you're covering up the tube, that's going to drive you nuts. So when you stick this in, you want to just easily slide it through which is why it's important for you to clean up the bottom bore of the bottom tree to make this uh, go as easy as possible. I'm putting on a 35 mil Kayaba front end. Uh, there's lots of different length tubes uh, available at lowbrowcustoms.com. Depends on how long or short you want your front end to look for your bike to sit in the style that you want. I'm just kind of wiggle it to make it, make it go in straight. There we go. Slip that in there. All right, now for the other side. Another trick that you can use to help make it slide in nice is just apply a little bit of WD. You're not going to hurt anything. And there we go. And you want to tighten your top caps first because those draw uh, your 35 mil tubes into the taper. The top of the tubes actually have a taper on them. And so they need to be drawn all the way up to your top tree before you tighten your pinch bolts. Okay, now that we have the tubes installed, I'm going to tighten up the pinch bolts and we're going to run a lowbrow headlight mount that uh, bolts in the pinch bolt location. So I might as well bolt that on. And it's a great spot to mount your headlight. Most chopper mounts or chopper lights will bolt right to that. And it's just a clean look. It's pretty classic chopper.
So this is the front wheel we're gonna use. This is a lowbrow spool chopper 21 front wheel. And they actually carry different spacers for you to bolt it right into your stock front end with your stock axle. A couple things I should go over before I put this on is we're using a 35 mil Kayaba front end, but there's more than one 35 millimeter and there's also more than one spacer kit for 35 mils. The one we're using is Kayaba, but the other 35 millimeter is a Showa. And the easiest way to determine between a Showa and a Kayaba is a Kayaba only has one cap on the bottom of the lower leg to squeeze the axle in place, how the other side of the lower leg is solid. On a, a Showa front end, each side actually has the cap. So here's both of the legs off a Showa, and they both have a cap. I've also seen Showas that don't have this notch uh, to move, I think it's for a single disc that uh, actually gives you more clearance between the disc and your speedo drive, and it actually looks mirrored on both sides. And if you have that show a front end, you should buy the single disc Kayaba, which I believe is also in the uh, description on the Lowbrow website. So I jacked up the bike to get the front end at the right height for the front wheel to fit, and I'm gonna fit this in place. I got the front wheel, we're gonna stick the axle in, and then you have to put the first spacer on. There we go, get that in. Slip around to the other side. There we go. So we're going to tighten up the, the uh, cap on the side and you have to make sure that when you tighten these up that the gaps are even front to back. You don't want to uh, tighten this up crooked. And we're only going to snug this up because we have to tighten up the actual axle first and it has to be able to slide to take up the slop uh, between your axle spacers. So we're not going to give that a front torque yet. But we want it to hold it while we torque the axle. Okay, and we're just going to snug those up, and like I said before, just make sure to keep those even. And that looks good. Now we're going to let this thing down. I want to look at the stance. Wow, look at that. There's no weight on the front end. Look at how cool that thing looks for just some off the shelf uh, parts. Didn't even take us that long to bolt it on. Yeah, it goes up a little bit in the front. It's a Saturday chopper. <laughs> so since it's on wheels, this isn't gonna be the only motorcycle that I'm working on. So I wanna make it real easy to roll around my shop. And uh, so I already put the kickstand on and the next step is to bolt on some handlebars. So these are the handlebars we're gonna run. They're really killer, super narrow, 60s, um, 60s narrow chopper bars made by Forco in Japan. And to run these handlebars, uh, they actually make a, a really cool clamp that bolts onto your top tree, eliminating where the isolator is mounted just to move the risers uh, in a little bit skinnier to compensate for how narrow the bars are at the bottom. So to do so, we're just gonna pop out the old isolators. Get rid of those. Just pop those out. And the top one, it looks like there's steps just to snap in. All right. And so it comes with these machine pieces for the bottom and you slip those on. And it comes with all the hardware that you need. Same thing on the other side. These are directional. You can see how the step is larger on one side than it is on the other. And you just want to make sure to use the side that fits in the bore nicely. And 
and we got to tighten that up before we tighten uh, put the handlebars on because you won't be able to get to the bolt afterwards. They're sweet. I really like these. Okay, now we just snug these on. And this is the same as the bottom of the fork leg. You're gonna to wanna to make the gaps even and don't have it cocked to one side. Just make them as even as you can. Roll those forward just a little. Usually when setting up handlebars, I like to make them uh, parallel with the fork tubes, but it's all personal preference and whatever's most comfortable for you and I want, don't really know exactly where I want the bars at until I sit on the bike. Yeah, those are cool. Man, look how narrow that is. I really like the look of that riser. Very cool part. So I flipped the bike around on the lift and now we're going to mount the chain. And so I already have it jacked up a little bit so the, uh, the rear wheel can spin freely. And we're gonna put on uh, this Diamond 530 chain. So I have the chain uh, laced through the uh, sprocket on the drum and the sprocket on the transmission, and we have the axle all the way forward in the axle plate to give you the most amount of adjustment through your uh, dropouts. And so we're going to cut the chain now, and we have to figure out which link to remove that we're going to replace our master link with. So we have basically an inner link and an outer link on the chain and you, the master link connects two inner links together. So you have to find the place that's the closest forward where you have two inner links to make. You see how I just moved those? When we push this pin out, you're gonna have these two inner links to connect with the master link. So I have this, I have this chain breaker tool. Uh, I don't, wouldn't say it's the best one. Uh, Lowbrow carries a chain breaker tool that you can use uh, if you do not have one. It's better than using a grinder, but I don't know if I'd uh, go on board with saying this is the nicest chain breaker I've ever used. <laughs> but it does the job, and it is much easier if, say, you work back and forth between the link, and don't just do uh, one side to where the link cocks real bad. But like I said, this isn't the nicest chain breaker I've ever used. 
So I got one, I got one link pushed out on one side. I don't want it to cock super bad, so I'm gonna do it on the other side too. Yeah, it might be time for me to get my own chain breaker, a new one from Lowbrow, and stop using that piece of junk. So now we got it in, and we're gonna put our master link on. I like to feed it in through the back. And I don't like to put the clip on until final assembly because I don't want to stretch that clip out too many times before it's going to go down the road. Now that we got the chain on with the master link, I'm going to save the clip for later and uh, just put this somewhere safe so I don't lose it. But I don't want to keep uh, putting the clip on and off this link to stretch it out and so it doesn't fall off while I'm riding. So uh, I got the chain on there and I like to adjust it a little tight when I'm uh, still mocking up the bike because we have to mount a fender and a bunch of other stuff and if you set it up at like the riding adjustment where you have enough play in the chain uh, your chain's going to stretch out instantly so i like to set it up a little tight so that when it stretches out it almost stretches out where all your clearances and stuff still look perfect and it kind of just gives you longevity of when your fender is on there that it still looks good for the longest because the further your tire and wheel gets back away from the fender the radius of the fender doesn't follow the radius of the rim as nice so i just like to set it up a little tight just to keep that radius as nice as possible for the longest you don't have to do this this is kind of more of a, a showy type uh, tip but it's what i like to do on all the bikes that i work on so and I don't like to put it too tight, but just, just tighter than I would set it to ride at. And that's about there. The next thing we have to do is measure for the adjustment to be the same left and right. And it's kind of tricky to, um, there's not really a good place and you can't always trust the adjusters if you wanted to measure them there. Some people like to do that. My technique, I like to measure from the center of the axle to a spot on the frame. And this being uh, having bolts like mirrored on the same side of the frame that I can get to on the left, that I can get to on the right, those locations, I uh, can measure from one of those bolts to the center of the axle on the right side and the same on the left. And when that measurement's the same, then the wheel is perfectly straight in the frame. Okay, 21 and a 16th. We're gonna go to the other side and do the same thing. And this actually has to come back just a hair, so. There's my wrench, there we go. Coming. We'll look at the wheel, how it looks in the frame. And I think that looks pretty good. We're gonna keep it there. So now we're gonna lock everything down and just lock down the axle and then I'll lock my uh, lock nuts down on the axle adjusters. I maybe should have run a die. The chrome on these brand new uh, adjusters is really thick so Next time, next time this is off, I might run a die down here just to make it a little easier to move on here. You got to keep in mind that this, uh, the tension that I have on this chain is only for mock-up and I would never ride my motorcycle down the street with the chain that tight. You'll blow up your transmission. So keep that in mind when you're doing this. This is just for when you build the bike. 
So we're not going to be using the stock oil tank on this bike. We're going to go with a gas box horseshoe oil tank. And these oil tanks are great because they bolt right into your motorcycle without any fab at all. All the mounts, it just bolts right on. And everybody loves a horse style, horseshoe style oil tank. They work better on hardtails because uh, using this oil tank, you, it eliminates any place for you to mount a battery on your bike. But since it's a rigid motorcycle, there's a great place for you to mount a battery below. All Ironhead Sportsters that had a horseshoe style oil tank like this had a magneto. So unless you run a magneto, you're kind of limited and have to run this on a rigid style Sportster. So we're gonna bolt this right in. Uh, we're gonna start with the lower mount and I have the bolts taken out. It goes bolts right on top of the uh, rear motor mount location, right on the top of the motor. And so that fits right in with big slotted tabs uh, for a little bit of adjustment. Another nice thing about this oil tank is it also works with electric start. So this bracket is bent to fit around the solenoid and not be in the way of if you wanted to run an electric start as well. So those bolts right on there and I keep them a little loose just so you have a little bit of adjustment because the rear mounts actually just bolt between the frame with spacers. So there's actually no welding or anything that you have to do to this. Another great feature of this oil tank is where all the oil lines are uh, placed. We have the uh, return and the vent and then we have a drain plug and a feed and everything's on the left side and all your lines can come straight under and go to the top of your motor. So we're gonna bolt this in, slips right around all your stock tabs. And I like to bolt, bolt it on from underneath first. And then here's the mount for the rear. And then that's going to fit. This cutout is actually, there's a tab up that's still welded to the frame and that's actually gonna fit around the tab and these spacers give it just that right amount of squeeze in the rear of the tubes. And I tighten up these ones first because it's on a, those tabs are slotted that go to the motor mount so they can move around, but these ones can't. So we're gonna pull the oil tank as far as it needs to be. And these are set up so you can tighten them up and it's gonna smush the tank just enough to give it that squeeze. snug everything else up and this is ready to rock. What a cool oil tank that you don't have to do any kind of fabrication on to bolt it in your motorcycle. And that's it. You got a chopper tank. Check that thing out. Yeah, it looks great in there. I think that was pretty good for day one.